All right, folks, welcome to the Monsters, Madness, and Magic Podcast. I'm your host, Justin, here with a quick word before we dive in. Now, in this episode, I chat with actor N. Rattel about the age of the streaming service, meditation, mushrooms, wizards, Hogwarts Legacy, Dead Silence, James Wan, and more. As always, thank you for listening, and if you'd like to help the show grow, please leave us a review wherever you're listening to the podcast. Anyway, without further ado, here you go. Greetings, boils and ghouls. This is your comrade, the Crypt Keeper here, reporting dead from the sanctuary of the strange. Tonight's macabre myth is a fright-filled feature, one overflowing with monsters, madness, and magic. <laughs> Take us back in time to when you were a youngster. Were you a book reader, fort builder, troublemaker, or all of the above? Oh, I would have been a bookmaker and a trouble reader. You see, uh, what you have to remember is that anybody under the age of, what, 30, maybe even 40, can't understand a world without the internet. You know, when uh, when I was a kid, I was closer to the Victorian era than the 21st century. So it was books and comics. You went out and you made your own fun with a bat and the ball. I mean, we played with stuff that would now be totally banned, like you made a bow and arrow. We played with things called catapults. What did you call them? Slingshots. Yes, yes. You'd think, oh my God, who on earth would give a kid that? At the age of three, as soon as you could walk, you were chucked outside. And my brother and I uh, would be going to, he was a year older than me, about 18 months. So at the ages of six and five, respectively, We'd be going to the movies, so it was a, a totally different world in uh, in that respect. But you know, it uh, it kind of toughened you up. It <laughs> gave you character and strength. Because when you fell out of a tree and and broke your arm, you weren't going to do that again. When you got hit by a car for walking across the road without looking, you weren't going to do that again. <laughs> Right on. <laughs> so when you think back to maybe some of the, uh, like you just said, you know, there was no internet, but when you think back to some of those formative films that you went to go see in some early TV shows from back in those days, what comes to mind? Well, a lot of it was confusion because they didn't have the same uh, certification that they did now. So uh, one week it would be, you know, a John Wayne cowboy film. And the next thing, and this really confused me, it was it'd be a musical by somebody like like Maria Lanza, or I think I remember seeing Carousel and them starting to sing and the music came out of nowhere and you just think, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> yeah, I should imagine that sitting in that vast auditorium, one of the ones I really remember, uh, a movie that really hit me was Snow White because that was the first major animation and I can still remember Dopey with those... Uh, with those gemstones and, and the mm. color and the vibrancy. Television wasn't really around much in Britain as much as it was in America, but uh, the movies, that gripped me. And so from the age of five onwards, for the next <laughs> God knows how many decades, you know, it's movies, movies, movies. Mm -hmm. But that's gone now, of course, because now it's streaming, streaming, streaming. Right. You mentioned that you were a book reader as well. Did you have a, a genre that you leaned towards? Do you a fantasy guy or...? The classics? No, it wasn't so much the classics. Well, first of all, uh, in England, comics was a huge, huge tradition. English people will remember the Beano Dandy Beza Topper, they were called. So there were at least half a dozen comics, not the comic books like Superman and stuff and Batman. I didn't get onto those till I was about 10 or 11. But books, it was stories, 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 and, and tales. Actually, you see, and you look at Lord of the Rings, I didn't, li I didn't read The Hobbit until I was 23, you know, and I thought, wow, this is great. And then Lord of the Rings. What about your parents? Were they involved in the arts at all? No, they were uh, Estonian refugees oh. after the war. So my father spoke about five languages. He was, uh, he had a career in the military before the war. He was in the Estonian cavalry, and it was his turn to ride the horse every other Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I labeled my unfortunate mother one of the clinically bewildered because 
she never really learned to speak speak English properly or read it. So everything that was happening was kind of confusing. You get that. You right. see it in the old movies when immigrants come and they go, "No, no, Papa, we speak English. We are in America now. You know, <laughs> we were not in the old country." Um, uh, and so the parents weren't any influence uh, in that at all. In fact, you know, when I went to drama school, my father, being quite academic, said, uh, uh, I mean, he obviously thought that me as an actor would be a, a hopeless situation. So when I said I was going to drama school, he said, um, yeah, well, but uh, that means you'll be able to teach, won't it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you're not going to succeed, but at least you'll learn your craft and can teach other people who will be better than you. <laughs> were you were a theater or drama kid early on? No, I was just uh, I was just a mimic. It was monkey see, monkey do. Mm. I mean, because we accept the reality of the world we're born into, and we learn everything by copying. You know, you learn to write by copying the alphabet. You learn your character by copying and resonating with what people are wearing or, or listening to, and then you find your own voice. So, well, with me, everything was sort of mimicry you know cartoon voices and things yogi bear smarter than the average bear boo boo <laughs> um, you know yeah and you just you just just mimic that stuff and then you realize you've got a a, a facility for it but in terms of uh, of going into the acting profession or whatever no that was but i was also um i, I was i was very very shy really insecure as a kid so uh, you know kids today i think have a lot more have a lot more confidence instilled in them and if a kid at the age of five or six thinks hey daddy i want to be an actor you know they go well yeah off you go but no Th that idea didn't really fully germinate until a lot later on and for better or for worse it's much easier for someone young getting started out to get that exposure and just by sending out a video online you know you could get how many eyes on you oh my god yeah i mean you know celebrity status or uh, reality stars or anything like that that was there was absolutely no notion of that if you were going to be on television radio uh, movies whatever you had to have some form of, of skill you had to either be a very attractive person that people wanted to look at or you had to be um pretty clever or, or gifted the simple fact of just being famous or a celebrity it just didn't exist i mean don't forget i mean it was the same in america in uh, up until what the 90s or whatever there was what three channels three right. four channels of, and the rest of it was radio the entry point was pretty narrow now if you've got any i i mean now you can go down to best buy get yourself a little camcorder and you can make your own movie and it won't look that much different to what we saw at the oscars before that they showed you on the oscars what a huge 35 mil camera looked like it was it just just an impossibility now social media influencers any notion of that somebody just coming on and saying hey i found this i found this body lotion and it's really <laughs> great you should try it and they go yeah i'll try that you know so the whole thing has opened up vastly actually paradoxically makes it more makes it more difficult the oversaturation now yeah i mean when i started acting it was almost like a, a club you'd audition and you knew most of the guys you'd be up against but in terms of voiceovers doing voiceover work in England, they'd cast the actor and not the voice. So the producer would be working with the voiceover agents and say, listen, you know, I need somebody to do a German accent and this and that. And they say, well, then I'll be able to do that. All right, we use him because it's not just, it, it's, the, it's the skill and not just, not just the voice. Whereas here, it's rather different. They don't just cast the actor They'll audition, listen to the voice and think, oh, that's the guy, but they won't cast you. Even if they've worked with you before, they'll still say, hey, read this and see if you can do it and not just r rely on the acting ability. That's a major difference. And, and also, so now, again, it's, it's opened up with non-union work and stuff. People are coming in from all over. Unfortunately, then um, diminishes the remuneration because exactly. when you've got such a, a broad field to draw on, you just say, well, there you are, look, 50 bucks, take it or leave it. 
Yeah, and just from the yeah. audience perspective, uh, you got to catch their eyes pretty quick. You know, with the way attention spans are, and just the amount of content out there, you got a few minutes to catch their eye before they're switching to the next app or the next thing that's on Netflix. You know. Yeah, exactly, and uh, it has its benefits as well because if they're casting their net that wide, then it means you've got a chance. In the old days, they'd be listening to maybe or, or considering maybe half a dozen people. Now. 20, 30, 40, 50, whatever. And also, they don't really want to use the same person twice. That's why if you were looking at old old movies, old television series, you'd see the same character actors cropping up because it was almost like a repertory company. Now, if you do you know, a Netflix series and you've got the leading role, that may well be your whole career because you're the bloke from, or the girl from whatever series, and you know now we want a totally different face because the audience is fed up with you. <laughs> And that's the beauty of voice work, because mm. if you operate the way that I do, which isn't just using your um, your own voice, then no matter what you look like, if you sound right, away you go. I did something for Heineken the other day, and, um, and I was being a cowboy. Now, here's a Brit, and there you go, there he is, he's a cowboy. <laughs> You know, you know, one of the craziest things I ever did was years ago, I was the voice of El Pollo Loco. El Pollo Loco, crazy you can taste. So God knows how many Latinos there are in Los Angeles, Latino actors that are capable of doing that. And instead they cast a, a, a Brit doing a faux Spanish accent. But what they, what they wanted was, do you remember there was a, a beer ad for Dos Equis? And there mm. was a guy with a gravelly voice. Yep. I don't always drink beer, but when I do, I drink Dos Equis. And so they wanted that kind of El Pollo Loco. Try a new chicken tostada for only $10. They wanted that kind of voice. So <laughs> I suppose in, in that instance, they weren't just casting the voice. It was it was the performance. But that really made me laugh. That right. was about 10 years ago. <laughs> I, used, I used to get great fun out of seeing that and telling people. Audition for an English person and uh, and wouldn't get it. It's so ridiculous. I remember <laughs> at the same time, there was a, uh, was a campaign for spam. And it was, you know, the sort of Monty Python spam a lot thing, you know, so spam, spam, spam. It was an American, and to my ear, you know, his accent wasn't wasn't quite right, but you know, it's a crazy <laughs> world. It's a crazy world. It is. Your own acting career started on stage. How did the shift to screen happen for you? Well, I started stage and television, a bunch of television series, one of which has actually been resurrected. The funny thing is, as my voiceover career was developing, I did a silent series, which we filmed first of all in America, and a box set, it's called The Optimist, mm. and a box set of that is being put together, which will be out in April. And that's weird, it's, it's a kind of Mr. Bean thing, uh, sort of, you know, uh, it was totally silent. And there was I, my voiceover career going, Phew. How did it happen? It happened sort of simultaneously. I did a series in England called Spitting Image, which was a satirical show that did impersonations and spoofing the royal family, uh, members of government and celebrities with puppets. You had it here, but it, it didn't quite didn't quite work. And so that kind of coincided with a really creative time on uh, radio advertising. Mm -hmm. So they wanted people with a, a vocal facility. And so quite often you'd be doing a radio ad and you'd be paying two or three people talking to yourself, which I also did on Spitting Image because at the time two people that were famous were, well, Dustin Hoffman, so, you know, he was kind of big at the time, this little squeaky voice, <laughs> and Walter Matthau. So I'd be doing Walter Matthau talking to Dustin Hoffman and just move from one to the other. An interesting fact is that Homer Simpson is based on an actor called Walter Matthau. Because when they started that, what you find a lot of people do when they're trying to find a voice is think of somebody famous that they can impersonate yeah. and then just tweak it. And that happened a lot in The Simpsons. Like, Mo, the bartender, it's kind of based on uh, Al Pacino. But you tweak it. Uh, Please, Chief Wiggum, was uh, Edward G. Robinson. Oh, yeah. And so Dan Castaneda originally based Homer Simpson on Walter Matthau. And so it was a kind of, hey, boy, what are you doing? Come over here. Duh. And then it kind of, you know, morphed into his own way of doing things. 
Uh, and so that that's a trick that most people will use because if you're doing a voice, then you will be guided by the sort of style of it. So an evilly voice, you might be on a sort of Vincent Price or, you know, a cultured villain. Uh, wizards are always either a kind of Sir Alec guinness sort of thing. It's a joint, and then you kind of morph it and don't make it a straightforward Im- impression. It's uh, Maurice LaMarche who does the brain as uh, just Orson Welles. Yeah, and also the wonderful thing is with time, then, you know, you go back far enough and nobody can remember who these people are. Yep. Uh, you know, I think if you're going to make a movie, just go, just go right back to the beginning, look at the 30s or the 40s and look at a film that worked and just revamp it. Don't no, actually it- remake it like... You know, they did redid Psycho and uh, a bunch of others, but just think, oh, well, I'll steal all that. You know, it's what they did with music. Yeah. I mean, you know, the Beatles and, and all these guys, they were listening to classical music, you know, Bach and Beethoven and, and pinching riffs, r- uh, riffs, the birds with tambourine man, the bit at the beginning, dum, diddle, 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 diddle. that's a Bach riff. Uh, and they've just done that, stuck it on the front, and, you know, away you go. So. I suppose there's a there's a, a different a not much difference between homage and plagiarism. <laughs> it's a thin line. Yeah. We're all influenced and borrowing from each other. Yeah, and you know, there's nothing new under the sun and it's just uh, uh, you know, a variation on a theme. So what was the catalyst for your move from the UK to the United States? I don't know. Well, I first came to the States in 1980-81. It's the lure of Hollywood and movies and uh, and you think yeah, there was a, a friend of mine as well that I was at drama school with, Carrie Fisher, who lived over here. So I hung out with her and I thought, well, yeah. And then it took off in England in the 80s and 90s. And I kind of got fed up with the, the weather and the grind in England and thought, life's an adventure and up stumps and, and came over. Now, I don't think I can really go back because of the weather. You get kind of spoiled by uh, the eternal sunshine in California. And plus, you know, it keeps it keeps rolling on. You know, at points you think, oh, well, that's it, I'm done. But then with voice work, there's no reason for it to stop. Do you remember struggling with the shift between the UK and the US at all? Is there a, a major difference for an actor working in the States versus the UK in those days? As I say, in, in England, the difference is that you don't really audition. You are cast because the producers know what you can and can't do. Whereas here, the annoying thing is, we do it all online now, but having to go into William Morris or whoever your voiceover agent is and read copy, and there'd be loads of you reading for it. So God knows how many times you came second. In the yeah. old days, if, if somebody said, oh, look, there's, um, there's, there's an availability check or there's a pencil, you'd think, oh, well, there you are, I've got the job. But now, so often, it just means you've come second because uh, they've got the guy. But uh, just in case, they're holding you as well. So it's uh, well, what I do say here is there's a lot more work available if you can get it. But, but also then it, it is it is a business of fad and fashion. And uh, decades ago, you would never, ever hear women doing um, voiceovers for major things. It was always the authoritative voice. Hey, silly woman in kitchen, buy this salt powder. I am the voice of authority. Uh, and that's gone. Now it's the, hey, I'm just a girl like you, and I use this. So uh, that's that's a major change, the demographics. Yeah, but that's the way the world, the world is change. Obviously, you've seen a vast technological shift from the early days of voice acting to now. Like you said, most of it's done remote. Most people I've talked to said the, the experience was a lot more communal back in the 80s, and maybe you have more people. Like, say you're doing a TV series or a cartoon or whatever, you have everyone in the room doing their parts, and it's more you, you play off each other as opposed to being isolated in a booth, I guess. Oh, yeah, that was, again, that was a major difference coming over here because in England, you'd all be together and you'd be bouncing off each other. So if there's a two-hander, three-hander, you'd be there around the mic. But here, doing animation or everything, really, uh, it's really weird. I found it weird at first to just, like with all video games, just to just do your own lines. And sometimes the producer might read you in, but it's it's not the same thing. And the first time I experienced that was doing Corpse Bride for Tim Burton because that was just me. Uh, I think I only did 
one session with Helena Bonham Carter because she wanted somebody to bounce off and I happened to be there and uh, and that's the only time but there is to me there's a, a great difference between the sort of dynamics you get by acting with somebody else actually off the top of my head the only time that I've done it since in America when we were all in the booth together about half a dozen people was doing um, what was a, a British animation which was done over here called Postman Pat but it is it is it is very rare but seems to work doesn't it it does work uh, there are there are a few projects games that I know that have done the communal experience and you can tell that it, that it's done that way yeah, if you were doing a radio play, you know, like, like they like they used to uh, in the old days. I mean, here and over there, the person you're talking to or you know having dialogue with is is there. Which uh, yeah, I suppose it is weird, really, because you wouldn't make a movie like that. You know, I mean, sometimes you do people's singles because the other actor isn't there. But in the main, you wouldn't be filming actors individually and that that again with total body acting that that's something that's difficult when you audition because the casting director will read the lines and just very flat and bland and so it's difficult to respond correctly so you've done a lot of voice work is there a particular voice that was harsh on the vocal cords that you'd rather never do again oh well virtually every uh, every video game where you've got a character that dies <laughs> because <laughs> That's the great thing about playing wizards and the like, because they don't get disemboweled at the end. But <laughs> there's always the uh, there's always the ah the the short death the ah the bigger death the falling off falling off a cliff all, all those those are the ones that that get you at the end. With Hogwarts Legacy, there was an awful lot of those. <laughs> awful those no n nothing else is harsh on vocals because it's it is only if you're going to be screaming or shouting right i've heard the same thing from other folks who have worked with their voice a lot that you have sometimes 10 to 20 just different sort of deaths <laughs> yeah, screaming your head I, off i keep saying uh, you know like you do uh, you do um, a goblin or something that, that, that dies a thousand deaths and then there'd be another character an orky one or something and you think well look, that sounds the same as that why don't you just have these on a loop like they do with gunfire have you noticed with gunfire in all movies there's always a ricochet when there's nothing to bounce on mm, yeah <laughs> So even as a kid, my brother and I, we, we noticed this because the guns didn't just go, go they would go, so when we were firing guns, we'd go, and I've recently been watching, because it's on, um, on Amazon Prime, a series called The Avengers with Diana Rigg, it's an old 60s thing, but they're firing guns all the time, and I laugh my head off because in a room where there's just cardboard boxes and stuff, when people start firing guns, you get the <laughs> pew, pew. <laughs> That's the only thing. Or if you've got, if you've got um, a particularly, you know, aggressive kind of character that just, you know, keeps page after page of uh, something that's really shouty, and uh, that, then, <laughs> yeah, that will take its toll. Well, you just mentioned Hogwarts Legacy. How, was that just a typical audition for you, or a right place, right time situation? I really can't remember. It started, I thought it was going to be like any other video game because this, I think it's what been at least three years in the making because of, I mean, there was the major hiatus in the middle. But I remember the producer on the writers, Natalie, she knew of me and so uh, being British and so she wanted to cast me and yeah I read but I remember first off there was a, a couple of parts and things and then it sort of disappeared for ages but this is it was in development an awful long time and uh, you know it took an awful long time to put together so yeah it just kept rolling on and uh, you know I've never done so many voices in uh, on any other project normally you come in you might be doing two or three voices and that's it you're off uh, and so at the beginning i thought oh well here's here's another one but it just it just kept going right and you said it was pretty much in development for a long time but then it does get released and it's pretty much the biggest launch of all time uh, how did you get wind of the news that it was so big and doing so well well, I think, Natalie, at one point when we were recording, she said, she did say, she said, this is going to be, this is going to be big. <laughs> this will be, uh, this will be one of the big games. Of the year. And I thought, oh, because I do them, but 
I don't play them, so right. I, I don't really pay attention. It's like uh, I don't actually want to uh, listen to anything that I've done because I'll just think, oh, God, that's terrible. Oh, I should have done this, should have done that. It's like at the moment I've done a series called The Wing Feather Saga, an animated series, and do a bunch of voices on that, but I won't watch it. So have you, is that pretty much consistent throughout your career? You just never like watching your work? Oh, yeah. Or, or listening because I just, oh, I think, oh, dear, oh, dear. No, 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 no. Because the thing about voice work, it's, it's all about choice. I remember once I was doing a, a French character, and when I auditioned for it, it was a French character, and uh, I thought, well, you know, I can be maybe something like, um, you know, Inspector Clouseau, I could be like that sort of Frenchman, but um, I decided to be more like uh, Jean Renault and to give it, um, you know, a bit of the French gravel and a bit of weight. And so I got the gig and we're doing it. The, uh, the writer producer, the other energy suddenly stopped and said, can I stop you there? I said, he said, I just have to say something. He said, this is great. He said, because you're doing exactly what I heard in my head. And I thought, oh shit, that's the key. You've got to be psychic. You don't just think, oh, I will do this. You've got to think, what is it that this person wants? Because if I'd gone the other route, he would have gone, no, that's not what I want. It wouldn't have been, hmm, well, that's not what I want, but that act is interesting. Do it again and try it like this and this. You have to second guess or think, you know, every virtually every job I've ever done, when you go into the booth, one of the first things I say is, right, how would you like this? Because then it throws it back on them and says, right, now I'm not going to guess what you want. Tell me what it is and I'll, I'll, I'll try and provide it. But I suppose with Hogwarts Legacy as it's sort of set, it's a prequel, it's set in the Victorian era, then there is a more specific sort of Britishness as opposed to being in a Guy Ritchie thing and being contemporary. So tip number one, mind reading. Oh, Absolutely. <laughs> Just instead of, you know, this is what I'm giving you, think, what is it? How does he see this? So one of my questions was, you know, have you ever watched anyone play the games to uh, just see your work in action? But obviously you've already, you already uh, answered. Yeah. yeah, well, to be honest, I remember with Elder Scrolls, I remember looking at one or two characters there and thinking, oh, oh, yeah. No, because <laughs> then... I think it will only get in the way. It's like actors that look at themselves instead of just instead of just being the part. They'll look and think, "Oh dear, oh no, don't do that with your face. Oh no, don't do this, don't do that." And then you become too self-conscious instead of just going within, having that spontaneity or that intuitive way of doing it. So you were uh, also involved in my personal favorite James Wan movie, uh, Dead Silence. I oh yes. Now, yes. were you just was that just remotely as well? Did you ever get a chance to go on set or anything like that? No, no, that was that was pretty early on. Yeah, that was the little. <laughs> I can't, can't remember how I did it, but the uh, the puppet. No, no, he was there, and uh, that was all uh, that was all dubbed. That gotcha. was all done in in session. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah, I remember that. That's quite a while ago. So, but James Wan uh, did meet you. You did meet with him, and he oh, was there. Yes, yes, gotcha. yes. No, that was all. That was all ADR work done post, which you do because you know you have to film the ventriloquist puppy, then put on the voice animation and stuff. Obviously, works the other way around. They animate to the to the track. But oh yeah, no, oh, I can remember that. Didn't watch the film. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed it, so thank you. <laughs> Didn't watch the film, no. So, out of all the projects you've worked on, what would you consider the most challenging? Is there one that you've lost the most sleep over? I've never really lost sleep over any of it, because if you're cast and you're doing the job, it's probably because you're the right guy for the job. That probably had been one or two where I think, oh... No, this this isn't me, but that would be commercials or you're asked to do something that you just, I can't do this. One of the things I, I don't really enjoy is doing audio books because I'm, oh, that I would, yeah, no, that is, that is actually the most challenging because I'm a sprinter, not a marathon runner. I can't sit there for page after page after page without fluffing or getting word blind. Most of the audiobooks I've read haven't been straightforward stories. They've been heavy, 
heavily technical like the life of trees the borgias the tsars and you just think i cannot pronounce these bloody names i've just done a book which was kind of okay but no i think from here on in uh, why we say never again i suppose the the most the career pinnacle job really has to be working for spielberg doing tintin that was motion capture so that's total body and, and total voice i tell you sitting there covered in little dots all over your face with a with a wetsuit outfit and having Spielberg there with Peter Jackson down the line in, in New Zealand and acting with Daniel Craig, Jamie Bell. It's one of those where I thought, what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> um, so that, uh, you know, working with Mr. Spielberg. I've had previous guests say that a motion capture feels more akin to theater to them. Would you say, would you agree with that? Oh, yeah, because there isn't the pressure. I remember the first time I was in front of a 35 mil camera, it was for a, a commercial. You know, the only thing I was, cameras frightened the life out of me because all I could think was, don't mess up, don't mess up, because this is so expensive. When you're doing theater, you've rehearsed for three weeks, a month, and so you know it inside out. You have nerves before you go on, but, you know, after... You know, a couple of couple of minutes, you're fine, and away you go because you're absolutely solid in what you're doing. Television cameras, they frightened, they frightened the life out of me. And I remember the first one of the first commercials I did was for Tony Scott, Ridley Scott's brother, who is uh, an amazing director. But I was so I was so naive that we were doing this um, this scene in an airport, and the camera was behind me, and I thought oh my God, I'm not going to be in it. So as I was saying my lines, I kept just turning my head a little bit because I thought then I'll be in it. And so he did that. And then he said, all right, cut. Okay, let's set up for the reverses. And he moved the camera. And I had absolutely no idea. And I remember doing uh, Merchant of Venice for the BBC. That was probably one of my first televisions, Shakespeare. It was like 20 minutes without a cut, with all those multiple cameras moving, doing Shakespeare, and I didn't freeze, but my voice went kind of squeaky. <laughs> and all I was thinking was, don't mess up, don't mess up. Uh, and with motion capture, doesn't matter. You're completely surrounded, everything's being recorded. Stephen had a, like a little iPad to see what was shown and saying, okay, no, no, so, so do that again and move here, move there. There's, okay, that's fine. Okay, now do that. And it was just like one continuous rehearsal because uh, as i said it didn't it didn't matter what i mean with uh, with most on camera stuff when it was 35 mil you'd rehearse you'd rehearse then you'd shoot you might rehearse maybe one or two on camera but with motion capture because the whole room is literally surrounded by cameras you just and they digitally just keep going you did say that audiobooks were you found them the most challenging how long are most sessions how long are you sitting there well a book of 300 pages or so depending on the difficulty and how good you are at it you might do 70 80 pages a day so it's four or five days the last one i did was again see i don't speak german i don't know why i did it i don't speak german but it was a book on hitler's war against degenerative art uh, and that took forever. And then I also had to read the notes. And you think, nobody's going to listen to this. But that was tough. That took like about five days. So, you know, 10 till, 10 till 4, 4.30 with a break for lunch and just sitting there reading, reading, reading. There is, you know, there's some friends of mine that are absolutely brilliant at it and do it all day long. Maybe if I did more of them, but <laughs> just to sit there reading page after page. Try it. <laughs> go and, go and find, I'm telling you to like, go and find a book and then just sit there and, and read it out loud to yourself and I bet you after three pages maybe a page and a half you think oh I'm fed up with this Come yeah on. I'm already I'm agreeing with you I can imagine it'd be a lot more enjoyable if you were doing some kind of material that you enjoyed but also I can't listen to audio books because I fall asleep just listening and so if i listen to anything on tape I, I, i'll fall asleep because if there's nothing visual to keep me engaged it will be slowly as the sun set over the horizon mary walked down the street towards the cottage there she met and, and the voice just becomes 
a bit like hypnosis. Mm -hmm. You feel very, very tired. You are now going to close your eyes and imagine you're on a, you know, and I just go. (laughs) (laughs) Agreed. (laughs) So no more audio books. So Ian, what would you say is the best acting advice you've received in your career and who gave it to you? But with voiceovers, the best advice I had was uh, when you're reading it is just imagine you're just talking to one person. So instead of being immersed in your head, it's like you're just talking to one person and you're saying, thinking of buying a bike, then come to the bicycle warehouse, you know, and for total body acting, it's three things. Think it, feel it, reveal it because acting is a projection of thought. If you've ever been on stage with anybody or you've ever done anything face to face, you can see it in their eyes the second before they dry or lose it. So when you're on stage and you're talking to an actor, the moment you think that they think, shit, I don't know what to say next, you can see it cross their eyes. And that's what movie acting is. It, it is that projection of thought, which is what method acting is about, which is basically feeling it. So think it, feel it, reveal it. But I would say the same thing then also does apply to voiceover acting. It's not just enough to say the words and say, well, you know, people tell me I have a beautiful speaking voice, so I should just read this without any thought behind it. No. Yeah, that's something uh, Michael Bell, who is a voice acting coach, said when I spoke with him that a lot of students that come to him come with him specifically saying that you know they feel like they have a good voice but they have no acting chops you know there's voice acting there's also an acting aspect you have to have but but also there's total body actors like say a tony hopkins mike amajon all these guys uh when i was doing voiceovers in england there was an there were an awful lot of celebrities that started to do voiceovers and i remember people like mike gambon and tony hopkins saying this isn't as easy as it looks. At first, they thought, well, you know, you know you're know, you a schlub, but, you know, I'm an award-winning actor. I would just read this, but it's totally different. It's a different form of projection. It's a different form of, of being able to get it across uh, simply by how you stress things and you still have to, have to feel it, but without the benefit of your body. Uh, I mean, you know, people like, Steve McQueen or Clint Eastwood would just tear out pages of dialogue and say, oh, I can do this with a look. <laughs> and you can on the movies. You can't do that. Right. You know? So it is a subtle use of getting things across, and it has to be learned. And some people can do it naturally. Some people, great actors, can't do it at all. They just sound flat and dull. <laughs> Well said. So just to wind down in, I'm not going to keep you all morning here. This is something I like to ask everybody because you never know what they're going to say. Have you ever had an experience that you would consider supernatural or paranormal? Yes, but I won't go into detail because it's to do with ayahuasca. So, uh, yeah, ayahuasca and um, and there have been there have been other things. Yes. Yes is the answer. There we go. Also, I would say with, with things like ayahuasca and um, psilocybin, let's, let's just go down there for a bit. There is no quick fix. Things like that will open the doors of perception, but the real hard work for any kind of spiritual growth is meditation. In the same way that uh, if you want to go to the gym and transform your body, you can't just walk in there one day and pull up a bunch of weights and, and think, well, nothing's happened. You've got to put in the hard yards. Have you been meditating for a long time? Yeah. I'm not as committed as I I should be because I'm a Gemini. And so, uh, (laughs) and so, but I know what can be achieved by the kind of commitment it it takes. But five, ten minutes is going to do you, yeah, the power of good. As St. Paul said, pray without ceasing, which Mm. kind of means, in Buddhist terms, mindfulness, just continual continual commitment and, and continual focus oh dear this has got heavy isn't it <laughs> this is where where we wanted to be <laughs> well this is this is what happens when you ask questions like that exactly that's what i was looking for <laughs> <laughs> well and just to put a bow on everything what's on the horizon for you and can you tell us about anything without getting in trouble well i was supposed to be going to uh, england to, to do some uh, filming in february march that's fallen through the wing feather saga is ongoing as I said, I just read a book. You never know when anything's going to pop up, but there is nothing There is nothing major on the horizon. Maybe Hogwarts 2. What about that? 
we'll be looking forward to that <laughs> i'm speaking with natalie soon so i'll uh, put that in her ear oh good well give her my regards i will and uh thank you for giving me some of your time today it's been a pleasure to get to chat with you no thank you thank you arrivederci all right folks that's a wrap i hope you enjoyed that chat within as always thanks for listening and we'll see you back next time monsters madness and magic <laughs> Welcome to the night. You think you know Night Demon? Then the Night Demon Heavy Metal Podcast is for you. Step into the darkness as we peel back the curtain to give you an unprecedented, all access look into the mind and the heart of the demon. We're talking band history, song analysis, studio anecdotes, stories from the road. It's everything a diehard Night Demon fan could want and more. This is the only place to learn the inside scoop, the deep dive trivia, the untold tales from the band members themselves and those closest to the Night Demon story. Need more? The sacred Night Demon crypt will be pried open to reveal demo recordings that have never before seen the light of day. All with in-depth commentary by the band and the people who were there for the writing and recording process. This is a gold mine, a treasure trove of all things Night Demon. Head over to nightdemon.net or wherever you listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts.